Well, here we are back. This is Dr. J. Smith. And as you can see, I've got someone new over here. Uh, this is Thomas Alexander from Germany. Thomas, this is the first time we've ever had you on Fander Films, is it not? Yeah. Hi, Jay. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, listen, Thomas, I want you, what I want you to do, this is a new thing we've been doing. For those of you who've been following through Fander Films, we've been bringing all kinds of different men uh, from different countries. Mel, you all know Mel from Ireland. He is the first that I brought on board. Robert Spencer, I brought on board uh, over a year ago uh, from America. I've also had Murad. Murad has been around for a number of years now from the Middle East. And then more recently, I've been bringing people like Joe from Red Judaism and also Paul from London. And then most recently, you've all been enjoying Odon, Odon who, La Fontaine from France. And we've heard the French school, we've heard the Irish school, we've heard the English school, and we've also heard the Middle Eastern one, but we've not heard the German school. And it's the German school that I've been waiting to talk to and find out about. But I, you know, the problem with the German school is I don't speak German. And I assume that most of you who are listening <laughs> don't speak German as well. But Thomas is German. On top of that, he speaks fluent English. And what has been interesting about Thomas, he is one of those that I came to know because of the comments. The comments. I mean, we've always been saying, write comments. Reflect on what we're saying. Get back to us. Confront us agree with us, dispute with us, whatever way you do that, we read the comments. I do want to hear the comments because that's how we get peer reviewed. And Thomas has been doing that under a different name, but Thomas, uh, uh, not really confronted. He was uh, supporting some of the things I said. And the more I got to read his material, I said, hold on a minute. This guy really knows an awful lot and seems to be coming from a rich background. So I put out my feeler to him and I said, listen, whoever you are, I'd love to get to know you. I know that that's not your real name. People very rarely use their real name on the internet. But I said, here's my email, come and contact me. And so he did. And here he is. Thomas from Germany has now contacted me. And what is fascinating about Thomas is that he knows the Inada school. And I'm going to ask Thomas to go and introduce himself, but also explain who the Inada school is and what is it about the German school that is different than, say, the French or the British or the American or the Middle Eastern school concerning the historical critique? Because this is all to do with the historical critique. We're critiquing both Muhammad. We're critiquing the Quran. We're critiquing the origins of Islam in the 7th and 8th up until the ninth century. And he is going to bring you an entirely new way of looking at things. I've gone already through some of these uh, videos with Thomas, so I know where he's going to go with it, and I'm excited because he's going to introduce some new ideas that none of you, or maybe I should say that the majority of you have never heard before, certainly not on this channel. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Give us something about yourself. Give us a, a little bit of your background, and then can you unpack the Inara School, and can you start introducing us to some of the main players in Germany, uh, some of whose names we may know, but who what they did and what they, uh, their work and what they have found, we don't know. Over to you. God bless you. Thanks for coming on board. Yeah, thanks. Um, glad to be here. My name is Thomas, and uh, I've, my background is actually not in uh, history or religion, but in computer science, but I've always been a history nerd. So, and roughly, 20 years ago, I really started getting into a history of religion in general. And at first, I wasn't particularly interested in Islam. Um, but then, let's say 15 years ago, roughly 15 years ago, I stumbled upon a radio program, which had uh, Karl-Heinz Ohlig uh, as a guest. He's uh, one of the main figures of this Inara school you talked about. And he introduced me to some completely new ideas that I haven't, hadn't heard before. And, and that was sort of the, the trigger that led me down to this, into this rabbit hole. So I, I read up a lot uh, on this topic. Um, I really got involved. And, and um, I guess part of my personality and also my training is um, understanding and, and recognizing patterns, like in all kinds of data. 
And that's sort of what I did. With, uh, this is the man you're talking the, about, right? Exactly. So he published this book. Who wrote this book. He was an editor for this book. He was editor of this book. And uh, this is a book published by this Inara group. And they've published, I think, seven or eight books by now, all like this one. But only the first one, the one you're holding right now here, is uh, translated into English. All the others are only in German. Um, this is it. This is all we know about your that whole school <laughs> that's going on there in Germany. So thank you for actually, um, you're going to unpack some of what's in here, but you're also going to exactly. be showing us new stuff that is not in there that we need to hear about. Because there in Germany, you have a whole different branch of instruction. So let's, could you just explain what Inara is? It's just, it's a, an Arab word that basically means enlightenment. And that's what the group has called itself. Um, they are located in uh, Saarbrücken in Germany, or at least that's the core of them are located there. It's sort of a loose uh, group that they are all over the place, but the core of the group is in Saarbrücken in Germany. And they are basically building upon a long tradition in Germany of uh, historical criticism. And um, yeah, uh, I'm here to, today to introduce you to some of the main players, as you said, and then later on we'll see where the leads us and what they found out. Well, listen, so the Anada school, enlightenment is what it means. Uh, yeah, it's the Arabic word. But you're yeah. saying that they are in Western Germany. Saarbrücken is yes. a city. Okay. So this school, these are what you would, we would term the German revisionist school. Am I correct on that? Well, we could call them that, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Well, listen, they go way far back. They haven't, they're not rather recent. They're not as more recent as those who are, are Carl Zeiss, Oleg, and others. You're going to go and unpack a little bit about the German school. Exactly. Um, and I'm not just, not just looking at German scholars, but I'm looking basically at the history that this in our group is building upon, which is mainly located in Germany, but also includes others. Um, yeah, and I think with that, we could go right into my presentation. Okay. So we're going to look into the origins of Islam. And first, we're going to look at the Quran and particularly the critical Quran studies and the history thereof. So, but first of all, why even do this? Like, why even engage in, in historical critical studies? So, um, so let's first start with some facts about the Quran. So what we do know is that the early manuscripts of the Quran were written in what's called defective script, or in Latin, it's scriptio defectiva. And what it means is that there are no vowel markings or diacritics. So that means um, of the 28 consonants in the Arab alphabet, only seven are unique. The remaining signs can refer to from two up to five different consonants. So it means that we can't really distinguish between letters like F and Q, J and K, S and D, S and Sh, R and Z, D and D, T and Z, and so on and so forth. Um, we also have vastly differing styles within the Quran. Um, for, and we have for, for also three different words for God in the Quran, like Allah, Rab, and Rahman, which indicates three schools of scribes. Um, in many cases, a large number of short verses in the Quran are followed by one massive verse. So that's um, a, a good sign for an interpolation. Because um, if you think about it, at a point in time where the number of the verses was already established, if you want to add something, what you had to do was to blow up a single verse, basically, to not change the order of, uh, and of any, anything. So that's why we find those occasionally. So for example, Surah 7431 is one such case where we have lots of small verses and then all of a sudden a really long one. Um, so all of these are just like some surface level um, observations, but they already show us that there's definitely reason to go to look deeper into this, that there must be more than one author, for example. Um, yeah. And so okay. that's what people did. Yeah. This sounds this sounds similar to the biblical studies, the Hebrew biblical studies, and the documentary hypothesis that yes. we've had from the 1800s, coming out of Germany as well. So that's the similar problem exists with the Quran. You're saying exactly, and and that's also where the the people came originally from who started this whole um, endeavor of of analyzing the Quran. So they 
the, the first ones basically came from this biblical historical study and then they figured well let's let's have a look at the quran like nobody's done that before let's see what we find um yeah just so, so those who, who are new to what you're saying let me just unpack a little bit of what you're saying so we don't go too fast on this if you have a script that is defective it's not that, that doesn't mean necessarily it's defective it just yeah. it, does, it is not readable is what he's saying that's 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 the technical term yeah so what it means is basically yeah so the arab language basically um or in the arab written language you need to have those diacritical marks and the vowel signs to to properly make sense of uh, of a word if you don't have it there could be countless of words written uh, or hidden in there so that's what's called a rasm in in arabic so that's yeah um, a couple of letters without those those diacritical marks and there can be many many different words in there depending on how you put those those signs and the early quran manuscripts they don't have those signs yeah and of course the diacritical marks we're talking about are the dots above or below yeah. the line there are five dots that have been added yeah. since the seventh century and the eighth century we don't even know exactly when they were canonized and uh, became formalized some people say eight some say ninth others even i've heard say ten but two three dots above one dot would be the na or the n letter two dots would be the t letter three dots would be the th letter th as we know it one dot below would be the b letter and then two dots would be the ya so na ta ta ba ya so those five dots and also the vowels there were no vowels at the very beginning either the no dama exactly. if you look at this you're showing a picture of the birmingham folio there that's yeah. the two folios there you can see there are no dots there and there are no vowelizations that you're showing on that so there's an example of the scripto defecto uh, as as you as you call it yeah. exactly so that that's a te technical term it doesn't mean that uh, yeah as you said it doesn't mean that the language is defective or anything it's just this particular way of writing um is called scripto defectiva because you can't really interpret it without the dots dots were needed so they knew what they were reading and of course once you have, if you have just three letters, three bowl shaped letters, which, uh, and you put dots above it, you can get 19 different words. Some, uh, Al Fadi, my colleague, says you can get as many as 33 different words just by putting the dots in different places. And he is, exactly. that's, his, that's his native tongue. Okay. Exactly. Uh, the other thing you're, you're talking about is that there, since there are different names, just say for God, Allah Rab or Rahman. It could be completely different writers is what you're assuming and what you're inferring am i correct so there could be different writers suggesting therefore that it was not from heaven or sent down to a man named muhammad that these are different these are really different exactly. authors. so you're implying that there's different authorship exactly so in different places in the quran different words for god are used so that really implies that the writers or whoever wrote it used that word so it must have been different white writers so already you're implying that this is not eternal, that this does not come from Muhammad, or that this is not coming in from Uthman. You're saying that these are written at a later date by different authors. This is going to confront the standard Islamic narrative enormously right there. So you right out, we're just getting started with you, Thomas, and you're already shutting down any notion that this book could have come from or is eternal. That's in chapter 85, verse 22 of the Quran, or that it, had, can, that it cannot be changed. That's in chapter 10, verse 15. Uh, verse 15 in chapter 18 verse 27 or that it's protected by Allah himself and that's in chapter 15 verse 9 so you're really confronting what almost every 99 percent of all Muslims believe right there in just your first five minutes um I guess so yeah I mean I'm, I'm at this point I'm not drawing any conclusions yet but um I mean the facts speak for themselves for themselves okay. you're not coming to conclude you're just putting it out there that's and that's fine exactly Okay, so that's, I but mean, we'll get to conclusions. Yeah. You have come to a conclusion right there at the very bottom, clearly more than one author. So yeah, true, that's true. a conclusion. Yeah, that is one. And, author and there will be more. It's not from God. Yeah. Ooh, those are big ones. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I just want to make sure that everybody's following what you're saying, because you, yeah, there's an awful lot you have said in just your first five minutes that uh, Muslims will take umbrage with. But that's why we're here. We're here to actually ask these kind of questions and they may be damaging, but they need to be asked.